today we have a special guest which is uh, Harsh Gupta uh, as uh, Harsh is a regular contributor with Swarajya Live Mint uh, he is one of india's uh, uh, you know uh, finest uh, young minds who writes very copiously in the intersection of public policy and economics and uh, he is a very valued uh, friend and supporter of Swarajya as well uh, so i'm taking this opportunity to uh, have a discussion with harsh on uh, the economic response to the <clears throat> pandemic situation that has engulfed the world uh, harsh has been uh, uh, you know uh, sharing a whole lot of uh, thoughts and uh, how to deal with the economic response to the covid-19 situation so we'll have a uh, discussion with him around some of the key aspects of how the economic stimulus need to be shaped and you know in terms of whether the government of india's response so far to the uh, to the covid at least from an economic perspective has been robust enough harsh great to have you on the show hope you are staying safe wherever you are thank you prasanna yes i hope you are safe as well and the whole swaraj team yeah yeah oh, so harsh it's a privilege talking to you so let's uh, get going uh, so the first question uh, that i wanted to ask you harsh is that if you really look at the way uh, us and some of some of the european uh, countries uh, have responded economically to the uh, covid-19 situation it almost looks like they have thrown the proverbial kitchen at the sink so as to speak at the pandemic uh, you know they are doing massive income transfers they are doing you know uh, debt debt forbearance they are doing like uh, you know unleashing unlimited liquidity especially in terms of the monetary response generous bailout uh, you know and um, even the wage support program especially the payroll protection program in the us which has been like you know a huge hit though it ran out of money very quickly and uh, in terms of the numbers if you look at even let's like, let's say a country like germany the stimulus size is almost uh, 25% of the gdp if you look at the direct indirect components plus the monetary components and all that so if you are looking at this as the global playbook in terms of response to the pandemic uh, what do you think uh, is there any potential for replicability in the indian context and if so you know what are the constraints that we are looking at harsh question i think the question is on the minds of a lot of people as we struggle through this crisis i think the short answer is no it's not fully replicable for um, an emerging economy such as india which uh does not have such low levels of interest rates does not have that credibility with foreign investors even though a very small portion of our debt is held by foreigners and we'll come to that um i mean and we must keep in mind some of these packages as you i think indirectly mentioned are not all grants so 25% of germany's gdp the package is i think 1/5th is actual spending expenditure yeah expenditure 4/5th so around 20% is loans which will be guaranteed so there is an so there is a sovereign guarantee element guarantees absolutely so that obviously does not mean that germany's gdp will only be 5% because you know there will be massive uh, decline in growth this year growth, yeah. in fact there will be degrowth this year and there and there will be a lot of revenue not collected so a lot of deficit is baked into the cake even before you have a stimulus response um in addition to the deficit created by lower tax expenditure so that's true for across all countries including in india so when we generally think of stimulus we are what we are saying just to be clear for our listeners and viewers is that should we have some stimulus over and above the deficit that is already baked into the cake absolutely because tax revenue will fall sure. dramatically right so so you had a starting point you had mentioned something and say 3 and 1/2% of Uh, gdp at the central right. level officially for india just by two months of not uh, working in this financial year you probably have 2 and 1/2% of uh, potential uh, growth expansion growth. already gone up to say almost 6% right and then you have off the book and then you have states and this and that absolutely so the question is uh, so this is known as an automatic stabilizer in macroeconomics you know without doing anything you already are having some kind of keynesian response stimulus so the question is what to do over and above that so in that example in that context germany is spending 5% of gdp over and above whatever its stimulus will be india has probably the numbers vary depending on so if it was a 1.7 lakh crore package that was first announced for the poor but some of the components were already again front loading loading oh, already budgeted yes, it's been front loading exactly so there was an element of front loading of what was already mentioned earlier 
So, you know, if you depending on how you count it, 0.5, 0.8%, at most 1% of GDP. Um, so, India has not announced, we've done something on the monetary Correct. policy, yes. Uh, but we've not really announced a very massive fiscal side package fiscal side. yet. Yeah. Uh, now, so can we do something of the, uh, something like what the West is doing, what Japan is doing? No, not to that extent. But, but are, we are much better placed than many other emerging market economies and we are much better placed than we ourselves were if this would have happened, say, five or six years ago. Right. And we can we can come to that. But sure. that's basically a short, an, short, short answer. answer. So, Harsh, uh, staying on to the point you said in terms of the size of the stimulus. So, I think like uh, been reading around uh, some of the estimates that have been put so, like you said, it's going to be like a double blow because one is obviously the tax revenues are going to fall because of the lack of economic activity and the stringent slowdown. And obviously, there is going to be a whole lot of expenditure from the government side. So, you know, basically, you're looking at like almost and also there are off balance uh, things that India has been uh, legacy wise carrying it. So, you're let's assume that you're almost looking at like, say, a 10 lakh crore kind of a deficit and, you know, we, we do a... 5% GDP type of a stimulus because you said like, of course, India can afford, cannot afford the kind of stimulus that the uh, West has done. So if, if assume that we bite the bullet and do like a 5%, 10 lakh crore type of a stimulus, how do you think India is going to get the uh, money for uh, doing this level of uh, stimulus actually? I think it's a very relevant and excellent question. So let's, before going into the numbers, let us first try to think uh, from first principles, right? I mean, so, assume for simplicity's sake that Indian sovereign debt is not really held by foreigners. I mean, it's not it's not fully true. There is some debt held by foreigners, and all these agencies lending to India, for example, World Bank or the Japanese and this and that, uh, on so-called concessional terms, they're effectively sovereign debt, right? I mean, it can be rolled over so and so much. But let's assume for a moment that, unlike, for example, in Indonesia where I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but 30 to 40 percent of their GDP um, is held as sovereign debt by foreigners. That number is at least 10 times less in India. So assume for a moment it's zero, just round it. So what is, if you think, what is the constraint as you very, I think your last question you put it, what is the constraint theoretically, abstractly, and then we can come to practically. The constraint is if we are to print money, the constraint is obviously inflation. In, in, in a macroeconomic sense and legal Correct. policy regulations and in a, in, a, in a political sense and by extension, what it means for our currency. Currency. Uh, so obviously for the currency, I don't think a lot of people will cry if it you know grows weaker uh, because you know our exporters benefit. That's not of prime concern, but inflation is a clear, hard constraint. Um, so, so just keeping that in mind, that's one constraint. So now you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, well, look, all these ideas which are in the realm of um, just, you know, far left or far right speculation or, or some kind of Silicon Valley kind of ideas like MMT and UBI are now being discussed in India. And there are multiple takes on that. But I'll give you a very simple way to think about it. Uh, so assume there are two scenarios in, a, in an economy. One where inflation, we are far away from the inflation barrier, in this case, say 4%. So that is another way of putting it is core inflation is low, or wholesale inflation is low, or industry utilization is low. Absolutely. Which is what India today looks like even before we before the pandemic. This. And and another case is let's say India of 2011, 12, 13, where capacity utilization is high, inflation is in double digits, whether in headline, in core, in wholesale, and therefore the GDP deflator as well, all close to double digits. So there are two scenarios. So let's say the first scenario, let us say the RBI just prints money. I mean, there are, it is, it's a very different mechanism, primary market, secondary market, we'll come to it. But let us say the RBI prints money and gives to the government. And the government has two ways of spending it, right? One on just consumption and one on building some kind of asset. Asset. So that's one part. And the other part is when you are, when inflation is already a constraint. And again, you can spend money on either consumption or some kind of investment. So this is a simple two into two framework. Framework. So in the, in the, in the first case, Theoretically, it makes sense that if because we are away from capacity utilization and from inflation, inflation. as of now, whether we spend that that so-called new money, that so-called helicopter magic helicopter money, money on inflation or consumption, in both the cases, at least for the short and medium term, it should help us. It gets demand back. 
even if you're spending on investment, that money has to indirectly go to demand, right? Absolutely. So it gets a demand back. Therefore, the factories which are right now sitting idle and their workers who are getting part-time pay and not full-time pay, they are therefore being unproductive and what India can produce and therefore consume is not being done, right? So the, some constraints to that because of monetary, fiscal or credit aversion by banks or NBFCs or in the now mutual funds, whatever that problem gets solved. If, if, if you spend it on something investment, it, over and above solving a short-term problem, it also increases the long-term growth capacity of the capacity. Economy. So if you, if you spend it on roads, good roads, it also helps with the long run. But in any case, consumption investment helps in the short term. If you are in a situation where you are near the inflation constraint or where in, in, utilization is high, in that case, if you spend on consumption, then you're basically instantly boosting inflation further because Absolutely. there is no not much supply left. Absolutely. At that point, you need a supply side response and not a demand side response. Demand side response. Yes, it, if you can finesse it somehow in that situation and most of that new money goes to investment, to some hard productive assets or even human capital done through an efficient, not non-unionized kind of way, then maybe theoretically that can also work out. Work out. But at least that is that is too close for comfort. Luckily, we are in this part of the world right now where we Absolutely. are away from the inflation constraint. You know, our WPI numbers have been around 1%. Core inflation has been around 3-4%. Deflation has been around 2-3%. And even before this coronavirus thing hit, our RBI numbers for industrial, industrial utilization capacity was 68 60, 60, 60. Uh, are in the low 70s at most. Um, so all of these things show that, mm. you know, even before, if you remember after the elections and before coronavirus hit, a lot of auto sales were down by 20-25% through most of the months, right? So in that case, if you have money printing or if you have cheaper loans, if you have people have fiscal transfers and people can therefore buy cars, which they need in the medium term, that is good for the economy. If they build houses or they build roads, that's good for the economy. So I think that's the first way to understand because because that helps us understand how further can we, how much can we push this. Correct. Correct. So, so now that you mentioned, and you know, just for our viewers, approximately last year, India's nominal GDP was around 200 lakh crores. So, also around 200 trillion. Uh, around 200 Two trillion. trillion. One lakh crore is a one trillion. And you mentioned around a rough number of 10 trillion, uh, which is 5%. 5%, 5 percent. Five percent of GDP. Can we do this over and above? Correct. Is the question. So one way to do it, I told you roughly 5 to 6%. 6 6% is baked in the cake at the central level without doing anything further. Anything further. Uh, let's say instead of uh, states, will also, we'll also give states some leeway. Let's say it's another 4%. So around 10% we've already, 9 to 10% we've already hit depending on whether we count off balance book items or not. Right. right? They're not that much. They're around 1% of GDP, but let's say around 10% GDP. So the, can we go to 15% of GDP uh, Remember the GDP this year, uh, real GDP growth might be just in one or two percent for all we know in FI 21. We don't know. It depends on how it goes out. How it goes. And uh, it might even be zero, might even be slightly negative. And since inflation will also be low, therefore nominal GDP growth will also be very low. What is nominal GDP growth? It is real GDP growth plus inflation. inflation. So if, if real GDP growth is also basically zero and inflation is almost zero, effectively nominal GDP growth is also zero. So remember, in a normal year, your base denominator, the deficit by GDP, your GDP increases by 10% say every year, Same. 10 to Correct. 12%. That's not happening. So it's not just the tax revenues less; it's also that the denominator is slower, uh, is lower, and therefore the overall number is a bit higher. Correct. Correct. So, so therefore, if we, it's just it's a question, it's a psychological mind game, whether we can go to 15% of GDP. My answer is, my guess is, we probably cannot. Cannot. Okay. okay. So we can probably, I mean, we can probably hit the, say, 12%. Correct. Higher, very low double digits, not even in the teens. Correct. I think that by itself is, for a lot of Indian policymakers and bureaucrats, is a bit of a small heart attack, right? I mean, they're just not used to thinking in those terms. Correct. Even though we are used to. Now, uh, another constraint a lot of people in minds is what about rating agencies? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's yeah. yeah. So I think that might have been a future question of yours, but let me just kind of... Uh, sure, that's okay. That's what I think of. Um, so these credit rating agencies, uh, you have to understand that except Moody's, I think, both S&P and Fitch, we are at the lowest possible investment grade rating. Already? I think, yes, I think Moody's took us uh, to the uh, to one level higher. In so 2014? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but I think recently they did take the, uh, the, the, the outlook on that from stable to negative. 
so when you do the outlook as negative it is just one step before Correct. degrading it so now the point is worst case what can happen moody's brings you back to where you were you're still investment grade i don't think any of these rating agencies would dare to in the right mind take us <laughs> below investment grade absolutely if if we stay below in 12 13% because india's uh, macroeconomic history as an independent republic is very clear we've never defaulted on any of our debt correct during the worst possible times correct we have uh, we have not never even had remotely anything close to hyperinflation correct we've had like close to double digit inflation that's about it right right uh, we have excellent fx reserves we have as you said low Absolutely. inflation correct uh, we have a bunch of structural reforms so basically uh, my point is what we were complaining about for many years the rating engines are not fair to us in this scenario it becomes a bit of a blessing because they can't go can't really take us much further down <laughs> Okay. So, so, so now, basically, so, uh, in your yes. assessment, there are still some set of commentators, especially you know, uh, uh, like say, uh, like the former RBI governor Rohit Patel and few others who are still advocating fiscal conservatism and saying that you know you keep your powder dry because you don't know how the pandemic is going to uh, unfold. So you know, don't uh, uh, what do you call? spread yourself uh, thin rather than you know uh, upfront type of a response uh, what is your uh, take on that that level of things because he, they seem to have a certain level of traction with our policy establishment as well that this thinking that you know uh, let's let's play safe and uh, we have we have uh, you know the inflation uh, slaying has been a success these are considered policy triumphs uh, policy victories and Uh, with the advice is that don't give them away looks like uh, you know w- what is wrong with this people who are advising all this if i may ask you no i i don't think see the point is it is the fault of the policy makers um who appointed these people with a certain context in mind at a certain time they made sense but they stuck with them and if they're still listening to them then i don't think there's any point blaming these particular right. advisors um see for an ideologue i i mean for an ideologue right for a hammer everything looks like a nail correct 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 so uh, for you mentioned urjit patel's name so urjit patel just wrote an indian express op-ed a couple of days ago i think just yesterday or a couple of days Day before, ago before i guess yeah um you know saying a bunch of things he said you know like we have to be more had we had had we been even more fiscally conservative earlier we would have had more space now um the monetary policy committee which was formed during modi's time uh, so that to have collective decision making on the interest rates as opposed to one person as it was happened earlier now the complaint is well the mpc is being side by past kind of a thing by the, the rbi government. governor is kind of unilaterally taking decisions on wherever he has technically powers but according to the urjit patel so the word it's not in spirit uh, with inflation targeting so for example the repo rate uh the rate at seven. which banks borrow from the rbi is set by um the mpc so you know the uh, so that was cut by 75 basis point when the mpc last met it was a special meeting um and uh, the reverse repo is the rate at which the the banks deposit Part money in the rbi set. that was cut by 90 basis point a bit more to discourage them to park excess liquidity there and not lend it out in the markets after that that was further cut uh and this was without the mpc the no repo 3.75% yes yeah, so right now it's at 3.75 exactly it was cut another by another 25 basis point so urjit patel is saying you know by doing this by not being fiscally conservative by buying dollars so one of the, one way of getting liquidity in the markets if you buy dollars you weaken the rupee you also have domestic liquidity and your exports get competitive correct something that something uh, which is this is something that urjit patel did not do in his tenure for example the rupee um i think in january 2018 was around 62 rupees um and then i think it went to if i'm not wrong uh, around 73 or 74 correct. or something like in september of 2018 um so so it it he he totally dropped the ball on that he is basically saying everything should happen through the mpc we should not use any other inst- unconventional monetary policy is extremely uncomfortable with that um uh, and this idea of basically saving for let's say there is a second wave in the winter or so on so forth theoretically these are all plausible they sound sensible you know but this reminds me of uh, you know warren buffett's quote you know he said it in a different context he said 
um you know if you have to do what you have to do there's no point delaying it <laughs> he said it's like delaying sex for old age old age uh, so at this point you know we have really uh, come to a situation where it is an emergency uh, so i think the franklin templeton mutual fund the credit risk schemes which managed about 25000 crore rupees uh, so that's a bit more than 3 billion dollars in current usd in our terms you know so they 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 stop redemptions so they they this this fund manager is one of the few guys who is doing non top grade investment non triple a kind of investments uh in commercial paper as a mutual fund as a as a buy side institution in india right i mean now uh because of the market illiquidity because of the risk aversion he has saying well let there be pain is capital face pain is what people say is moral hazard right okay so if you if you don't let them feel the pain they will do same kind of mistakes, mistakes in the future but the problem is this situation unlike say the 2008 situation is genuinely an act of god it's a force correct. majeure situation correct uh, and at this point we have to get beyond this kind of sadistic masochistic situation where the view. more pain right. the more purification correct and we have to understand that there is a systemic risk involved absolutely uh, because see the banks see the public sector banks are anyways not lending right now Correct. Correct. The private sector banks were mostly focusing on retail lending. Correct. Very. Even yeah. the pr- public sector banks, if you look at their books, a lot of the retail lending was actually buying the loan books of NBFCs. Absolutely. Which in turn the problem happened over the last two three years. Two three years. Again, because of very uh, tight, unnecessarily tight monetary. Monetary. And now we are having something in Franklin. Instead of deepening our bond market, therefore the way it's making in the short to medium term, it's making it worse. Now, if we had something like debt ETFs. you know where people sell the etf to somebody else in a secondary market so there's no redemption in a primary market sense so the mutual fund does not have to sell the underlying when you as a final end investor sells we since we don't have debt etfs in india except a couple of uh, government psu debt etfs by edelweiss which is just launched in i think january itself even that is very new but relatively liquid so the point is we are at a situation if we do not intervene now whether it's on the financial side whether it is on the msme side you know, because they have working capital problems how do we propose to replace or supplant even marginally the business that is supposed to come our side from china which we are all discussing yeah i think i think harsh basically what i hear you saying is that uh, all these doctrines and uh, you know your uh, ideological playbooks need to be thrown out of the window and focus on very uh in response to the situations of course the first principles remain but this is a extraordinary situation so you know you can't be dogmatic and uh, theoretical no see my point is uh, exactly you're right but now even even if you want to be dogmatic and theoretical there are so many nuances right nuances I mean, so for example when somebody like gurjeet patel let the rupee go up to 62 and then that's a, a, roughly around the time when the modi government started reintroducing moderate tariffs and you can agree or disagree whether moderate tariffs are imp- there some kind of 21st century import substitution is required for make in india to succeed or not there, that's a very interesting separate debate but the point is it would have been required to a lesser extent if we had a coherent rupee dollar policy correct or at least a rupee yuan policy like i mean the two most important exchange rates for india is dollar China and, and the dollar. us so these two crosses are very important so what was the point of view that was, if it is not articulated that something that can be gleaned by looking at their interventions in the forex market it seems that their idea was they just want to dampen volatility in the fx market and let the market find its own price so that's where they dropped the ball so because they tightened the situation so much they did not help through the currency front as well uh, since anyways the demonetization and gst is happening on the political executive side there was and then a uh, general re election was coming in there was so this whole thing added up and this covid 19 is the final blow so we we are have we've had so many sticks from the point of view of entrepreneurs and even a financial system and not many carrots except this corporate tax cut that happened last year so except that one uh, kind of carrot everything else has been a stick so you know as, a, as any good parent to know like, occasionally you have to be strict occasionally you have to be indulgent right, right, it's, right. A, it's a balance balance So if you are just constantly hitting the child, it ultimately is going to backfire. Correct, correct. So that gets me to the next question, Harsh. That since you spoke about the corporate tax, uh, so you know, what, uh, as you might be aware now, there is a general consensus that the global supply chain needs to be de-risked from uh, China. You know, there is 
there is kind of even an undercurrent of uh, anti chinese sentiment for the way in which you know they communicated on the pandemic and all that stuff so you know what are the policy moves that you think the government of india can quickly move to kind of you know capture some part of the value chain of course you spoke about the corporate tax which is like fairly competitive if you look at the asian level especially you know for the new manufacturing the corporate tax is 15% which is good but outside this tax cuts what are the two three specific things that that can be quickly done to get a part of uh, incentivize to move some part of the supply chain to india In- i think see it's at different levels uh, yeah yeah it depends whether you're speaking about a large corporate you're speaking about a medium or a small corporate um uh, i think realistically speaking land reforms are not happening realistically i mean there's no point discussing which is not going to happen with the current political economy framework no but i think like uh, as soon as they came to the power nda tried to dilute the land acquisition can they do it now basically when there is an opportunity again actually? i i well i think it can but i think uh, it was not just my personal views not it was not just the boot suit ki sarkar jai but it was also the fact that it is genuinely very easy to create apprehension amongst farmers and people in the rural areas that you know you would not get a very good or fair deal that you got in used to for your land and i think that is just a very difficult sell so i don't think that's happening that's happening uh, okay. realistically i mean even if it happens that will consume its own time and political time. capital i think there is a merger of the labor codes going on for a year or two uh, that might help on the margins i mean the biggest the reform there i understood was allowing themselves a power to fire at a higher number of employees say 300 instead of 100 without going to the parliament uh, so i think that again is relatively small potatoes relatively as of now small. so i think the big thing that you can do is again it comes back to the earlier point of uh, you know so what are the various costs of business one is a tax cost of business okay you've helped on that one is the export currency angle okay Correct. because the rupee is right now at 75 we'll come back to the fact that we need a clear currency policy in india Correct. we'll discuss that in, in a second uh third point is cost of money or interest rates and our interest rates not just at the repo reverse repo rate interest rates at their level that goes to a medium sized entrepreneur on the ground so the weighted average rate of lending for indian banks throughout last year was still north of 10% and the deposit uh, rates actually fell much faster than the lending rate average which increased the nims the net interest margin of the banks Correct. they might have done it because their nps were increasing again or whatever Absolutely. be the reason so what can be done is i'll give you an example uh, right now the banks are getting 3.75% um, if they are lending to rbi and we have 7 lakh crores or 7 trillion of that so almost 100 billion dollars which is simply parked by the banks thanks at rbi and this was half or less than half just a couple 3 4 months ago so this mon- this money has doubled but the all the extra liquidity is basically just going back to rbi and therefore it's a waste as far as we are concerned we are con- not so no, as no. the real economy is concerned so what what is stopping is now you can also you can further lower the reverse repo that's one part that should be done but along with that the the banks need to be somehow assured on the credit risk so on one thing we need a credit guarantee fund so i think that is already in the works Work there were some this. rumors came out in the news and there some some people were saying 3 lakh crores uh, so, so that will be classic case of 3 lakh or 10 lakh crores but that's not spending that is equivalent to the german 20% which is correct, loans correct. so and only what is the shortfall will be uh, then taken care by the yes by the government there also you can make sure that it's not 100% percent will not be taken care of by the government but say 95% so that the banks at least have some incentive to check who they are giving money correct, to correct. so that's one way that's one credit some kind of credit guarantee is definitely required and anybody who had an x overdraft immediately make it one and a half x or 2x right they are proposing 20% increase i would say that's too little so so maybe a bit more so that some kind of credit is required i think second part which is interesting is i think throughout the country especially for smaller entrepreneurs the only real personal wealth they have um, you know especially their business had bad cash flows or it was in semi formal sector not everything was in the wild for whatever reason is they have real estate as collateral and in india we need to re- not only reduce the mortgage rate but also loan against property rates if you want to do a loan against property so this let us say this is the same property x you know if you want to go and buy that as a new property so if i am selling it to you you will get 80% of that 
as a loan and you just have to put 20% down in some cases even less yeah. but if if i if i want to continue to own it i will only get 50% against it it's the same property so uh, presumably the collateral value is the same for the bank and there are some incentives given by the government sure but even adjusting for that for some reason it is the kind of step sister or step brother of indian retail lending so that is not needs to be looked into uh, secondly the tltr or the targeted ltros which was done for other sectors needs to be done for not just real estate on the building side but on mortgages and laps lap is loan against property so and if you can allow banks to do that as an htm where possible hold to maturity the reason why that is important is um, you know in, well in this case it might be uh, important for securitized mortgages so that there is no mark to market down but basically if i can get that 3.7 uh, sorry the 4% 4.4% right now repo rate because you're for 3 years and then just use it for mortgages and laps that will really boost uh, the mortgages including loan against properties and that is something a lot of people who own properties can easily get a lot of funding uh, that is collateral ready uh, you can the way you can further incentivize it because you can allow much larger expensing or much more deduction of emis uh on your income tax right now it is limited to 2 lakhs 1 and 1/2 lakhs on interest and principal it is very very small amounts uh so you can increase that amount by say 10 times basically if we as a country have to get out of this crisis um uh, this idea is especially useful because it gets your real estate market up as soon as the lockdown is over it gets a lot of blue collar construction work jobs created it allows small and medium businesses to raise money uh in a situation where the banks are much more comfortable over and above whatever they raise through the credit guarantee scheme because there is real collateral so whatever the value is if you don't want to give 80% give 60% but if but there is if you can borrow if the tltro scheme is extended for this mortgage and laps as well if you can currently borrow at 4.4% for 3 years which is almost certainly likely to be reduced further why can't you then uh, lend at 6.4% uh where you already have a very comfortable buffer in a in a real collateral and if if i can do that if i can raise money at even high sixes uh, right now because right now our mortgage is at 8% if you go to sbi 9% most of the banks if i can get at like 7% also for loan against property that is much much better than most multiplexes are getting right now right so we need to make sure that people where where existing collateral is already there some kind of credit guarantee scheme further lowering of reverse repo further cutting of the repo itself through the mpc uh, more fx intervention but also making sure that the real estate market is boosted through the mortgage uh, kind of lever and lending is boosted through the same property but through the loan against property i think that for a lot of small entrepreneurs will actually be a real practical boost practical issue okay great harsh harsh uh, so uh, getting into the last question of the day i think like you shared tremendous uh, insights uh, so far uh, so this again is as far as the government's uh, response goes you know like uh, see uh, i think the in terms of the health response to the pandemic uh, the government strictly implemented the lockdown you know for whatever it's worth and i think to some extent you can say that the lockdown has been successful in reducing the spread of the infection and also on the health policy side you could uh, say that you know of course there have been challenges in implementing the lockdown but overall i think the response and uh, even the uh, healthcare capacity uh, was enhanced and all that stuff so they got that part right but from the economic response perspective if you really look at uh, what we have currently is just one frugal uh, package which is uh, to be honest aimed at the vulnerable people actually so which is like what you estimated as 1.5 lakh crores but honestly speaking some something around 70 to 80000 crores so this entire uh, official speak from the government that we are trying to go with a staggered response and not a big bang response and all that though that is also being not said said in a very uh, coherent way so do you think there has been a communication uh, failure in terms of the economic response to the pandemic from the indian government or is there any scope for improvement that you would suggest 
I think failure would be too strong a word given obviously the circumstances are extraordinary. Yeah, something is big is work in progress. But yes, but I would agree that there is a lot of scope for improvement in the sense that again let's talk about the borrowings that the government will do. Right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the I didn't check today. I think the ten-year uh, government of India bond yield is around six point one or six six point one five percent. Um, there is no reason why it should be above six percent right now. It should be below six, and. one of the things that the bond market is waiting the treasury bond market is waiting is okay, when will the government give us an a rough idea nobody expects it to be precise i mean people are practical that okay for the rest of the calendar year or for the rest of the fiscal year this is the rough range that the government uh, intends to borrow, borrow. so you, you so you, it, you could say it could be for example 8 to 12 crores i mean it mean it, it can be a wideish range it may not be like 10.1 or something whatever the number is and you can say at least half of that for example and it could be more will be uh, through secondary purchases omos open market operations and we keep a call option we keep an option of say 2 3 lakh crores of direct primary issuance without guaranteeing that we will use it and we also say that we will not use it again it's a one time measure so if you just give a basic framework to the market then the market can do it, do its math and can do the calculation much better than anybody in the government and they'll therefore reduce the rate accordingly yeah. again let us remember that there is no foreign marginal buyer in the indian bond market especially the government bond market the way they are relevant in the indian equity market okay. and therefore since you the we and that, that's something we have earned by paying higher interest rates for a much longer time so now that when we do have that sovereignty if this is not the time to exercise it in a once in a century pandemic then when is the time to exercise it you know see there was the idea of the euro dollar bond sovereign bond which i supported i wrote about it in mint uh, the government proposed and then the government disposed i, I think it I think kind of kind quietly of abandoned it looks like again the good old uh, men of indian uh, public finance they wrote and they, to yes they said rangarajan to raghuram rajan they said you know well you know once we get it's, they basically said it's like the gateway theory of drugs and once you get used to it then what next no uh, there are very easy statutory limits you can you need a two third parliamentary vote for example to to have more than 1% of gdp as borrowing in a foreign currency which can which can be done in a bipartisan manner if the government is serious about doing it but anyways that fell flat but if now in this crisis if we cannot even use the rbi to increase the omos by at least 3 to 4 times and not just uh, target on the short term end of the curve but also on the medium long end of the curve then i am i am i am i am i'm at a loss of words and when will we do it right so my because you you have to understand if the if the 10y borrowing rate of the government remains above 6% uh bank deposit rates also cannot come down right i mean at some level they're in, they're linked there's a different credit risk is a different uh duration risk but at some if that goes to 5% then fd rates can also come down the government see this this crisis finally forced the government to reduce small saving rates by but not much though but up to 140 basis points but on average only 1 percentage let's say uh, not even that if you do a weighted average something around that uh, this should have been done so many uh, so what is now 3.75 percent in reverse repo exactly one year ago was 5.75 percent so this is a human tragedy a global tragedy but it is also an opportunity sent by the gods to the modi government saying that you know you've done very well on the structural reforms but for some weird uh, fetish of conservatism which you've taken to an extreme everything is good in moderation yeah everything is good in moderation this is an opportunity for a reset on indian economics on modi nomics um so that you know while all the sticks were there we finally have time for a healing balm and therefore if they do not take it absolutely um, it That's is ultimately the their own uh, political harm that they're doing whether it is the harm is severe enough to hurt them in state elections or 2024 time will say but the economy is at a situation where we are constantly under utilizing its capacity and and now it's at a extreme version of that of what to happen for the last 2 3 years so we have what if we had done the same thing last year people would said why are you doing it right now everybody is doing it so it's an excellent opportunity, opportunity in terms of communication to... in terms of explanation in terms of uh, in terms of just not having to explain actually beyond absolutely the absolutely uh, so so i think it's so um i think that between the extremes of 
so called writing of everybody's loans and not having any credit risk fund uh, the risk of just cutting by 20 remember the 75 basis point cut by rbi mpc the repo rate not the reverse repo was done 4 2 4 is to 2 still there still were, were uh, there were two there were two holdouts <laughs> so my point is when somebody like urjit patel says that the mpc should not be quote unquote bypassed i think practically from the point of view of the prime minister the finance minister and the rbi governor if there is resistance to even cutting by 75 basis point in a once in a century pandemic when you already were at a relatively higher starting point now you know there in macroeconomics uh, rate setting there's something known as taylor's rule uh, taylor's rule is simply saying that when your inflation current inflation is lower than your inflation target and your current growth is lower than your sustainable growth rate then if when both of them are there if one is there but especially if both of them are there then your your uh, inflation the interest rate set by the central bank should be that much lower so, so i mean, that's just that's uh, straightforward it's just a way to quantify yes, common sense yeah yes it's just a way to quantify common sense and there are many tweaks possible uh, so by john taylor he's a stanford professor and then the point is if this is if you say so if you do it that way if you do it in a qualitative sense if you look at it historically if you look at it in context of the uh, structural reforms done this is the time to go big Big. You may not be able to go as big as US, the Japan, US. but you are in a position to announce something over and above a credit guarantee scheme. So I'm not counting that as percentage of GDP. Over and above that, of start with one percent. If you want to do drip by drip, that's fine. But then at least do one percent. The one logic that the some people in the government say is, well, what's the point of announcing a stimulus when all the formal sectors of the economy are closed? well i mean they did not think of that logic when they were sending out uh, letters to factories to make sure the salaries are paid out yep <laughs> so it's, it's not like that the salary payment was suspended in fact they sent letter moral, moral persuasion, persuasion though, it's just not like a order yeah it was it was supposed to be moral suasion but you know it is it is very close in 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 some cases you have to pay i know in the case of west bengal somebody has gone to the courts uh, some a jute industrialist um so so i'm not sure it may, may may depend from industry to industry and state to state in some cases it may be so called obligatory some cases it may be voluntary but there has been clear pressure to make sure that there's no delay in salaries there's no cut in salaries and of course most a lot not have followed it but there has been clear pressure on that and my point is how does the government expect that it will be done um so a shot of instigating some kind of populist rhetoric or class war this the only practical way to do that is there is enough liquidity not at the bank or central bank level but at the level of the enterprises who need it enterprise absolutely and so so the credit guarantee scheme ideally should not be that difficult to structure it should have been done by now absolutely yes what you can do is uh, you, uh, for example they also try to help with the epf payments uh, in the but then they limited to 15000 so the problem with a lot no, of what yeah. the government has done is that it is right step right direction right but intention but always it's very incremental and not the kind of yeah you know, it's like the kind of hold back half hold back. so so, it, I, so it's a half government that seems to be psychologically divided about um you know letting go of its kind of religion for the last 6 years of fiscal conservatism correct correct you know and and religion as ambedkar <laughs> said it's for man man is not for uh, you know religion. for religion so it has to be time specific context specific so that i'll that's that's how i would think about it yeah so harsh uh, wonderful talking with you on that note where you're calling for a uh, you know sort of a, phys- a philosophical departure for this government from half measures to you know looking at uh, you know a big bang type of a thing thank you so much harsh it was really wonderful talking to you and uh, hope to take forward the discussion some other time thank you so much thank you sir rajesh thank you